And hello and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Anthony Tussler. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for everyone else. I think we're expecting a couple more people in, but Good. they will come as they can. Um, just so you know, Anthony has been my co-curator for Opulent Mobility since 2015. He reached out to me after the very, very first show in 2013 that I did. And we've been working together after that ever since. Um, since discovering the disability community in 1972, Anthony Tussler has advocated for disability civil rights and culture. A longtime wheelchair user, Anthony has championed disabled people in education, technology, the arts, and community. In his professional and personal activities, his goal is to improve the lives of people with disabilities and to encourage disability self-determination and culture. And he's doing great. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. So, where were we? Oh, scary. Yes, scary in the making of your own art. Well, I think that. I mean, as 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 a number, the one of the one of the terms that I tend to use is CRIPS, as shorthand for people with disabilities, and it's here in Northern California, in the home of the what we used to think of as the center of the disability rights movement before Crip Camp came out um, and realized there's a number of centers. Anyway, here in Northern California, we call each other Crips and I tend to use that shorthand. Um, so it's, one of the, looking at it, as a number of my Crip friends have said, you know, this is not for the faint of heart. You know, and and that's very much true. And a lot of that, usually that's talking about aging, you know, and it, aging with a disability is, is uh, can be fraught for, um, for damn sure. But I think also looking at who we are as disabled people, clearly without uh, sugarcoating it, looking at it closely, examining it closely uh, it, from a pers personal perspective can get scary because it, it is, it's a, um, uh, it is a stigmatized identity. You know, I'm not, um, you know, things have certainly gotten better as I have gotten older, you know, it, it's uh, disabilities become less stigmatized in many ways. Um, uh, it used to be as a uh, as a male paraplegic uh, in my 40s, uh, I was kind of at the top of the, the uh, pyramid. You know, there is a disability pyramid, you know, at the very top was those of us wheelchair users, you know, and then as you go down, and one of the things you don't want to do if you want to be higher on the per pyramid is um, uh, have the window of your face and arms and hands uh, be influenced. So if it's harder for somebody who can't, who drools or who, um, mm, mm, mm. you know, has involved speech, you know, that person then becomes uh, more stigmatized, you know, right. so there's more and less stigma. And um, so I used to be at the top of the pyramid. Getting older has put me further down on the pyramid, but also um, uh, I'm not as au courant, you know. Uh, people on the spectrum are, are now the ones who are kind of in the ascendancy. You know, they were very much stigmatized and very much uh, ostracized, you know. And so to take more center stage, a lot of energy is coming, going there, you know, so. Um, I don't find myself kind of in, in the center of the disability universe uh, uh -huh. like I used to. Also being a white male, a straight white male has, uh, I'm not quite in the center, particularly in the Bay Area. You know, as we recognize BIPOC and uh, different sexual orientations, you right. know, so it's kind of interesting to see who's, who's hip, who's current and who's not. 
I don't know how I got there, but that's but I did. Well, I was when I did my interview with Laura, um, I was talking about the paintings that you guys chose. They're part of a series called Look Closer, which was, is I'm painting about disability and sensuality. And um, I got like six paintings done. And then I had a, I, I was dealing, cause a lot of people with disabilities uh, are very lonely. I mean, they're not finding. It finding is isolating, partners. yeah. And I did find that it, it was easier for men in chairs to find partners. <laughs> than right. women in chairs, because um, I think some of it is that women are more open-minded or maybe more nurturing. I don't know what it is, but- uh, Well, even at its worst, you know, there's some women who want to be caretakers. Yeah, yeah, and and, mm. and not so many men. Who want very it. few men, yeah. And so, and then, you know, so, I just I, I pulled back a little bit from what I wanted to to say about sexuality. Like the nude I did, I almost put a a colostomy bag on her. Oh, that would have been good. Mm -hmm. And and I think I still want to do a nude with a colostomy bag, but that's putting a lot out there. That's yeah. putting a whole lot out there. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's some scary shit. There's no doubt about it. I know, I know. And I I I have a colostomy and I love it. I mean, it's been so much easier than what That's what I hear. Do. Yep. And um but you can't it's just you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, there's some inter If you've been uh following uh what uh uh Rachel Unger's been doing and talking yeah. about Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Her and, um, do you know Bethany Stevens? No. She's out of Georgia these days. And um, interesting woman. She did uh -huh. a whole series uh, uh, when the COVID shutdown came down of, of uh, 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 taking fashion photos of herself. And she's... Um, her disability is osteogenesis imperfecta, and so she's not very, she's not a very big woman. And um, is uh, she on? Is she was she on Instagram? Oh yeah, like mad for a while. She's not so much anymore. I may have seen her on there. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. And uh, when I asked Bethany, I said, "How do you identify?" And she said, "Let's see." I'm queer. Oh, I do. I, I knew there was a problem doing this in the afternoon after my nap that I was oh, going to no. not have access to some of my memory. <laughs> I probably have this wrong, but she says something along the lines of, um, well, I'm gay, but my wife calls herself queer. So, I mean, it was one of those kind of, you know, it was like all these different terms, you know, all put together. I right and and she's just real interested in those different kinds of identities and sexuality and so uh i think some interesting stuff's happening there in that arena i saw a book of photography years ago and uh i i want to look it up again but it was of it was black and white photographies of photography of people with disabilities and it wasn't total all you know there was a lot of shadow work in it uh but uh, what book would that have been i i can't remember it's but it's lodged back there in my mind somewhere i, I don't know if i saw it in a book or a magazine but i'm, I'm oh there was a german photographer who was doing some very um uh, who was doing nudes and they were, um, I can't remember the term that we use in photography for, uh, you know, there's a lot of shadows, a lot of very chiaroscuro uh, mm -hmm. looking. Okay. And um, 
That's a I word I've read, some... but never heard. Hmm? Chiaroscuro? It's a word I've read, but I haven't ever heard. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be I... afraid to say it. <laughs> I like chiaroscuro. I'm a big fan of Caravaggio. Um, but uh, he did some interesting work and he was in uh, New Mobility and he didn't do much after that. I don't know what happened to him. Hmm. But that's the only person I can think of that was doing work like that because there has not been much uh, photography of people with disabilities. Well, I will do some research, and if I can find it, I will. That would be uh, great. Thank you. Yeah. I remember seeing a, a very impressive photo of a man who was a quadruple amputee. Huh. I think he had stepped on landmine or something, and it was his back. And I mean, that that photograph is yeah. imprinted in my mind. But That would uh, be interesting to see, yeah. Because yeah. I, you know, I pay Very attention beautiful. to that stuff. Very beautiful. Yeah. What was your first encounter with disability art? I mean, apart from those stuff that you were making, Anthony. Well, I mean, a lot of it was uh, aversion. I mean, it's, uh, mm. uh, you know, I, being closeted, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was be enough be around another crip mm -hmm. you know and it, it's you know it's, it's the phenomenon certainly that i saw uh with women back in the the 70s where you know in a business setting two women didn't want to be seen talking to each other at a mm -hmm. business meeting because then it'd be like oh there's the women you mm -hmm. know and the same kind of thing was you know i didn't want to be seen hanging out with another disabled person because it's like oh there's the disabled people I could pretend in my own mind that, you know, I was passing, which I wasn't. Um, <laughs> and so I had a real aversion to, um, you know, anything disability related. And so much of it was uh, so saccharine back then, you know, that there's a good reason that I was averse to it. So, um, well, the what happened was that in 75, I was hired to be the uh, director of the Disability Resource Center at Sonoma State University to provide services to students with disabilities. And we had uh, advocated with the uh, uh, university to create that position and they did. Um, one of the things that I realized we needed, for some reason, I've always been good at marketing one of the things I realized we needed was a logo. And I thought naively that we could come up with a logo that would somehow represent disability. And so every time that a, a new student came in who was an art major in particular, I'd say, look, we need a, a logo. Can you work on it? And everybody'd go, oh, okay. And then nothing, nothing ever came around it. Hmm. Um, but I start, we started to meet artists with disabilities, students. One of them was um, uh, Martin Lazinski, and he did a, a, a number of photos documenting his disabilities received in Vietnam in combat. And he created an art piece of those along with, uh, interspersed with, uh, uh, copies of the uh, correspondence with the Department of Defense. Mm. You know, you, you lost use of this eye, so you get, you know, it's a 20% disability and you lost the use of this foot. So, you know, another 10% um, kind of thing. And then also Irby George, who was uh, had cystic fibrosis and was um, uh uh, documenting a number of his own uh, experiences with disability. And so those were really the first that, I think those were the first of people with disabilities documenting their disabilities. One of the most 
turning points, one of the reasons also that I realized that, that I got scared of, of pursuing art was uh, Tulsa by Larry Clark. I don't know if you remember. Larry Clark was a, um, a photographer and filmmaker, and he came out with a book in the late 70s called Tulsa. And it was documenting his life at the time, which was living with a bunch of uh, speed freaks in Tulsa. And the photos were very raw. One of them was um, uh, a guy had shot himself in the thigh. And, uh, you know, it was a picture of the guy, you know, showing the bullet hole in his thigh. And um, there is a photo of the... Um, a note that they hand wrote and put on the front door telling the uh, cops to, to, to get lost. I mean, it was just a very raw book and it was very um, pivotal. Hmm. And it, it was, before it was reprinted, I mean, there were copies going for $2,500 of this softbound book. Oh. And um, Larry Clark went on to make a movie called Kids yeah and he's kind of a um sick individual i think you know uh but uh but i looked at tulsa and i realized i couldn't be that real you know it was not gonna um mm. you know i didn't have the nerve to document my friends and what's going on in that same kind of way and then getting scared huh. by doing the uh, Cindy Sherman-esque work. And so, um, but with Irby George and Martin Lazinski, and then starting to do my own, playing with my own imagery. And so it's that play. Once I brought play into it, then it started to work for me. You know, we did a bunch of, there is a, a, a movement back in the early 70s called the Mail Art, M-A-I-L, um yep and where uh a call would go out for a uh, photograph for uh artworks and anything that was received we'd put up on the wall and it, part of it was a uh uh people uh uh reacting to the high what was then high prices of art they would have died if they had seen what Andy Warhol stuff yeah. going for, for instance. Um, uh, and so I was doing a lot of photo postcards and taking photos, uh, playing around with disability. And uh, let's see if one of those, I wish there was an easier way to uh, just think of the photo that I wanted and then have it show <laughs> up, you know? I don't know that we've reached that point yet in AI. Yeah, <laughs> near with AI, you know, it just, it might, you know. It could be, but I don't know that it's that good. At, it's searching through the uh, annals of your mind. Right. No, I don't think so. No, thank God. <laughs> That's probably safer for everybody, right? Right. You know, if I did I know, a better Joy, job did of you have a moment my... for that? Excuse photos. me, you could do. I was asking Joy if you had something that was your first disability art experience. Oh, let's see. Oh, um, I, mean, I think she's froze. Uh, um, you you should me? be able to find yours soon. I mean, let's see. Am I, am I yes. unfrozen? Okay. Yeah, you're unfrozen, yeah. Um, I threw the library. Uh, my disability art was uh, just... Um, looking at books through the library and uh, I would look for different styles of art and huh. and uh, more contemporary art but didn't didn't see a whole lot of it actually uh, I have a degenerative disease that started when I was 16 and um, when I got to be in my 30s I had to fatigue was really becoming a problem and I learned to sew and um, I decided to start making dolls. Oh, and, cool. And so I started like, well, why not make dolls that 
that have disabilities because I'd already gotten involved with our Center for Independent Living, as it was called at the time. And uh, I'd seen the film, Tell Them I'm a Mermaid. We had a really progressive member, uh, president uh, of, of the board who, uh, you know, brought in films on disability and sexuality. So I guess it was through film that uh, that I got my first look at disability art. Hmm. So, and then when I started making these fabric creations, because I could sit still and do them, and um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, so I made bird women, you know, with canes and things like that and, and wheelchair mermaids and, and stuff like that. So perfect. And did then, you have, a, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm? I just think being open to it and it, and us evolving as a society and it becoming more available to that we saw that I got to see more and more. So, right. of course, then there was the big Frida Kalu, you know, explosion in her art and her dealing with her injury and everything. So. Was that something that you had experienced with Frida Kahlo with the, um, with sort of the fascination with um, her prosthetics? I, I was asking Anthony. Oh, um, yeah. my, uh, my interest in, in Frida, I mean, it was just so obvious that, yes, she was, you know, uh, documenting her own disabilities, but not doing it from a, um, a disability consciousness. I mean, hmm. she was doing it from, uh, you know, an arts perspective and it was very uncompromising, you know, and clearly very, very good stuff, but not, it didn't have any resonance of um, uh, other dis other people with disabilities. Mm. Because, I mean, you know, when she was doing it, there, there was, there was so little uh, disability consciousness, you know, I mean, the, most noticeable disabled person was FDR, you know, and uh, Gallagher called him the cured, that FDR portrayed himself as the cured cripple, which is ex is very much as it was. I mean, everybody knew yeah. he had a disability, but he pretended not to be disabled so well that, you know, in, in many ways he was considered kind of cures, cured, even though he wasn't. Right. And so it's it's that, I mean, for me, I mean, what, what's been wonderful for me is having been born in 47, getting a disability in 52, I've really grown up with the disability rights movement. Uh huh. Ed was four or five years older than me. But, Ed Roberts? Yeah. But, um, but I've kind of been right at the bleeding edge of disability consciousness all along. And so as disability evolved, I, my thinking evolved and my art evolved, you know, so there in the seventies, you know, I was able to grapple with things much more. And by the early eighties, you know, we were able to do it full blown. You know, we had the first major art show where the art, one didn't have to have a disability to submit, but the pieces had to, uh, the subject matter had to be disability related, you know, and that toured the United States, got an NEA grant. And, um, you know, it was quite a success, but, you know, so, so we had a real consciousness by eight, uh, the early eighties of disability. But as far as disability art went, you know, it was another 20 years till we started to see art uh, shows that had disability as the subject matter. You know, it took people like Riva Lehrer, you know, who's younger than I, you know, in that whole Chicago scene to start making things happen. And people around the country, I mean, like, you know, it, it was happening everywhere. 
and where I think that uh, the big shift was, uh, I think Crip Camp has really uh, kicked everything into gear. Lately, right. yeah. I mean, that's actually made a big difference, I think. It's made a huge difference, I think, yeah. So I want to go back to Patricia said that um, there's a woman with a colostomy that you took a picture of. Who was that? Oh, EM Chick. I will I will take oh. a look at that. Oh, you can follow her at EM Chick, huh? Let me see. Um, is that on Instagram? There was a uh, thing. There's like col a National Colostomy Day where people are supposed to show their colostomy. <clears throat> so, huh? And I it decided to participate, and then I chickened out. Oh, <laughs> I do know it's well, become a lot more common to talk about it uh -huh. on a regular basis and to show them. Although sometimes uh, people will, like on Instagram, people will get, you know, bumped off for things like that, which is ridiculous. Well, I think since it's kind of a movement, like this is National Colostomy Day, show your colostomy. And, and I've seen stories of like people who are like, I don't care, I'm wearing my bikini anyway. So oh i just put her into the instagram along with as into the chat i mean her instagram along with as many other things as i could follow up with right, right, right. so if, if anybody else has other things that they'd like to share in there that's a great way um when people get the recording link they also get the chat yeah so, so no I've, I've been following somebody uh the chronic iconic Huh. Uh, One of the things that's interesting is um, a friend of mine's a wheelchair user and an artist, and she isn't on uh, Facebook because she gets too many devotees. You know, guys who are really interested in women wheelchair users. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Um, it's, it's some creepy shit for sure. Yeah, that there's there's a whole the fetishizing of the process right right exactly um and that can, that can get super creepy and it's like look you get to you get to be into whatever you are into but um leave me out of it well and also there are plenty of people who are not that cool <laughs> right, the right, idea exactly. of people only liking them for their for their amputated limb for example you know that's most people want to be liked for who they are I, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I've never gotten that. I've never had anyone uh, approach me for, because they like women in wheelchairs. Well, back in my bar drinking days, <laughs> I used to be hit on occasionally by women who are older oftentimes and not particularly desirable in the bar scene uh-huh and i got the feeling that they were hitting on me because they felt that i couldn't re turn them down because i would be desperate for company uh-huh mm. it was kind of creepy that is also creepy and yeah that's creepy i was in a long-term relationship back in my drinking days and i think that part of the dynamic was that um her insecurities, she didn't feel quite so insecure with a guy who was not higher up on the uh, food chain. Mm. Okay. It was the feeling, you know, there's just something off, you know. Yeah. And, and we've all got baggage, but, but that's uncomfortable. Yeah, it, a little, somewhat. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't super creepy by any means, you know. Her insecurities were pretty deep, mm. but um, uh, they oh. manifested in other ways. Anyway. Did you mostly um, choose photography as your medium, Anthony? Was it 
something that spoke to you more more than other forms? Well, the, the fact that my dad owned a camera store, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's not wrong. <laughs> and his dad was a photographer. There's a uh, uh, a photo of my grandfather. Uh, he was an architect. There's a, I saw a photo of him, uh, you know, and he's got a speed graphic in his hands. He's up there documenting stuff. I don't know if you guys know what a speed graphic is. It's the, those four by five cameras. When you think of press photographers from the 30s, those were speed uh -huh. graphics. Okay. And that was the camera I used when I was in is junior that, high. Was that the kind of accordion looking one? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, they are big and they're clunky. Um, and how I was able to use my crutches and carry a speed graphic and take pictures of the football games, I have no idea. But I was pretty athletic back then. Anyway, I told... Laura, that I was going to try not to digress, and I shall not. I shall try not to. Um, it's all good. It's all good. So I, I grew up with with cameras around. We never took snapshots. That's why there's no photos of me as a uh, my Halloween costumes. I mean, it just snapshots were not something one did. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, when I got together with my current wife. She and her family, they love to take snapshots. And I was horrified. So photography is a um, is something one should take seriously. That's why we wouldn't take we didn't take snapshots. Interesting. You know, you took photographs. You know, and I mean, certainly you could take portraits of your family members, but they're portraits. They weren't snapshots. You know, uh, my wife hmm. does PR. And she talks about uh, doing groups and you do a group and grin and a group and grin is when you're at a uh, like a fundraiser and you get a group of people together and you, everybody smile and you take a picture of them. one, two, three, and you push the button, you know, and then you publish it in the newsletter, you know, whereas uh, it drives her crazy because I go, OK, I'll take I'll take a group and grin one two, one, two. I push this one. I push the button. Because I want a more natural expression. Uh, and no. like, <laughs> right. She wants that pasted on smile. Um, so what I've discovered, though, is that if you put me in front of a plain piece of paper with a drawing pencil, I don't know mm -hmm. what to do with it. It's just, it, it's completely foreign to me if I take... If I did, you know, do a little sketching, it's just, you know, it, but I can be out and about and see something out of the corner of my eye and quick bring up my camera and take a picture of it. I can, I can see those moments mm. that make good photographs and sometimes make great photographs. And so that's a skill I've got and a skill that's gotten better over the years. It gets rusty at times and I have to practice again, but it, it's a skill I've got. So it turns out photography works really well for me. And now yeah. that, I mean, I had a dark, I had dark rooms over the years. Um, my last one was uh the house that I lived in, Katati, for 20 years, and I let it fall into disrepair as my uh, drinking got. I was much more interested in going to the bar than spending time in the dark room. Mm -hmm. um, and so I pretty much left my photography go for a number of years. You know, I, I got sober in 83, so, you know, certainly into the 90s. But so I, but I started to pay attention to digital photography. And at first, the quality wasn't good enough, and it was too expensive. But little by little, the the quality got high enough that I was willing to make the commitment, which I did. And now, I mean, good lord, to be able to have Lightroom and Photoshop and you know digital photography that you know takes these great photos. I mean, it's just wonderful. There's so much. 
I mean, you and I have talked an awful lot about disability art and the importance about it. You know, what what kind of an impact it makes with and showing people disability culture and within the disability community. Um, what do you I believe, feel? go ahead. No, you what do you feel? Let us all know. <laughs> um, I got dinged the other day on uh, Facebook for uh, posting a picture that I took back in the 70s of a rock and roll band. And it was a disability activist in my community saying, you know, why aren't you working more on disability activism? And um, the downsides of the uh, social media. But for me, I've done a lot of work you know, in the university, figuring out what it was that students with disabilities needed, advocating for that. Um, once the AD 504 came in and the ADA came in, um, it wasn't as interesting as when we were doing it back in the 70s and, and early 80s. Um, but I was kind of at the forefront of creating something you know, which was disability services in colleges and universities. And I helped start the first independent living center in this county, you know, which like Joy's uh, ILC has turned to crap. Um, but, you know, for many years was a was real voice for disabled people. And another thing that I've, I've been involved in is, uh, uh, visitability. It's the idea that all new construction should have basic accessibility. And it's a uh, it's an idea that hasn't gotten much traction, but we did get the city of Petaluma to pass a visitability ordinance. So I do work in some right. arenas where it's, it's, you know, straight up advocacy. But my belief is, that's a long way around to talk about art. I believe that the cutting edge now is to change how we, how the world sees disability and our perspective of our lives. And so Crip Camp, you know, is a good example of how the arts are used to change how people see disability and how we see our own disabled experience. We, uh, I uh, help run a, uh, spinal cord injury support group and we had about eight or nine people on last last month and we were talking about um uh do we celebrate our uh anniversaries for when we got our disabilities and mm -hmm. that con that conversation led into people talking about really how valuable they consider their disability experience wow and there's one incredibly sweet story by a woman who's part of the group who I don't know well, was saying she was with her or now her current husband and they got in a car crash and she got a spinal cord injury and, and became a wheelchair user. And they had been close, but with her disability, he was able to express his love for her by making their, the commitment between the two of them even stronger than it had been and eventually getting married. That's you know, and a very sweet story, you know, and that's the kind of thing that the world does not think of when they think of uh, wheelchair users. Right. And so it seems to me it's the arts that are explaining those kinds of uh, perspectives. You know, so it's like, I mean, going back to my getting scared, uh, you know, with Tulsa or, uh, you know, my Cindy Sherman-esque photos is it's showing our experiences through, our, through art that I think is the critical piece. I mean, that, that for me is at the core of it. And I think opulent mobility is kind of a... a it's not as raw as I like to wallow in, but it is so, 
different than what the world thinks, that it's part of opening up that whole understanding of dif disability. You know, and that's why I'm committed to it. You know, so yeah. fortunately, Laura, you know, with um, is that Mousseline in the background there? Melusine, yeah. Mo She's there. Uh, how do you pronounce it again? Melusine. Melusine. Um, you know, is much different than the kind of things that I have disability art. And yet, you know, it's broadening that whole perspective of disability. You know, and that's why I think disability art, you know, why I'm making a commitment, why I make a commitment to it. Plus, it's think, fun. Yeah. When uh, storytelling, when, man. <laughs> when so, I'm you, sorry, Joy. When you look at art for the show, when you curate the show, mm -hmm. what do you look for? So many things. But, I know um, there's a lot of different things, but you know what? I don't look for anything in particular. I mean, I think my fir the first cut is, is this crap? <laughs> you know, and it's, um, uh, there was a, uh, an animation that uh, was, <laughs> Lauren knows where I'm going with this. And it was, wasn't it a wheelchair that turned into a butterfly or something like that? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't bad. It was small. I didn't figure it was a big deal, but everybody latched onto that damn thing. It was, <laughs> it, it was kind of sweet, but it wasn't so bad. And, and Laura liked it. So I thought, oh, well, okay, yeah, we'll put it in. And, you know, but I was kind of like, well, I'm not sure. Well, everybody thought it was the bomb because it was, uh, you know, it, 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 it didn't push, you know, it, it, it wasn't, wasn't very strong in pushing the boundaries. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're but always when, looking for is things to, yeah. that are, you know, that are pushing the boundaries. Um, you know, do I respond to it? You know, like, you know, any art piece, you know, is this, is there something in it that calls to me? Is there something in it that uh, offends me? And is that offense because of my own stuff or because it's, it offends my aesthetics? I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's some things that offend me that, you know, we don't put in, you know, it's just, you know, it's, you know, as we've talked about a lot, um, too saccharine, you know, too, uh too stereotypical you know that sets things backwards rather than moving them forwards um but there are things that are offensive because i still have a lot of ableism and i can be triggered by things that i see mm -hmm. you know and i go ooh, and then i go oh maybe i need <laughs> to think about that maybe i need to think maybe i need to do some work here you know, and that's the fun stuff. Yeah. You know, and is it good? You know, is it um, is it done competently? You know, one of the things that's really important to me, I think it, it's called um, soft discrimination, where we lower the bar for people with disabilities or um, for other marginalized groups. Right. You, I don't want to see us lowering the the bar. You know, I I know it happened for um, uh, Fran Osborne. She when she did the Palo Alto show, you know, the Art of Disability Culture. It was a major show. It was big. Uh, she got involved in it because they wanted her to do a side room, and they were getting another show, disability show, and eventually she got to have the whole whole shebang and. We're talking Silicon Valley boys and girls. I mean, they have buckets full of money. They're complaining to me about their cutbacks. And it's, it was real. I mean, they, they were cut back and it's a drag. But when they wanted my art pieces, they had a guy drive up from Palo Alto 100, 100 miles to pick up my pieces. Hmm. Galleries do not do that. Galleries no. say, send us your art. You insure it. It's up to you. You get it to us and we'll put it on the wall. But 
you know, actually Bryn Mawr pays for the shipping because they have a grant, but their stuff is. I try, I try to do it at least one way, you know? I mean, it makes yeah. a difference. It's hard. So I'm trying no. to get more grant funding, yeah. you know? Anything anyway, you can do to make it more accessible. But. Yeah. So Palo Alto was a, was, a, was a major show. It was a big show. And one of their donors had a son with a disability. And he had a fairly competent drawing of a horse and wanted it in the show. And Fran found a place for it. But boy, I mean, it was talk about lowering the bar. You know, a somewhat competent drawing of a horse you know it's like when i was first getting involved with the Bryn Mawr show you know there's a lot of um horses out in dappled fields with uh wildflowers you know that disabled people were drawing you know that was just i mean kitsch of the first order so that's one of the things that i really look for is is this something that is uh just too um, too stereotypical and not done with any kind of uh, skill or artistry. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the person draws can draw a straight line. It is, I mean, it is, there's a lot of art that is expressive in a way that is new and important that may not have the best technical skills. So you balance that out, you know, is the, does the lack of technical skills get in the way or does, is it somewhat neutral to this expression? You know, so it's always, you know, balancing those things out. So I'm not always, I mean, occasionally it is. Yeah. I mean, I think, because um, Anthony and I don't always agree on, on the style of art, but we can generally degree, agree on what feels like it's important to include. Right. You know. And well, fortunately, our tastes is, are different. Which is good. I think it's important. Yeah. But we can argue beautifully. <laughs> right, right, right. And actually, there isn't much argument. You know, usually, usually it's yeah, becoming yeah. pretty usually obvious. Usually, like it's like, look, we need, we need something that covers this topic. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. But, uh, but Do you have a, it's, like, like, it's well done. Yeah. It's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> less but, of that lately, though. Yeah, way less. I mean, we've, we've had some really good stuff. And it's yeah. also, with some of it, it's just once things start to come together, it also becomes a little clearer right um if we you can start seeing a theme of the things that have come in with the submissions and what things start looking good together what will work well what oh, there's that too yeah create a cohesive show what will make what will make this shine you know because the whole at least for me when i was starting to do this with anthony i mean like i don't I'm seeing the art shows that are either very, very serious and frequently very angry, which is appropriate, you know? You're talking about marginalization. People get angry, but it's not the only way to communicate. And right. then I was seeing a lot of things that were very patronizing. Essentially, oh, look what those little people can do. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, they're... I'm like, I wanted something celebratory that doesn't like gloss over the hard parts right right but exactly. really celebrates disability in a way that i just wasn't seeing anywhere and that was the idea and i'm assuming that's what it <laughs> attracted you to what i was doing right in the right. first place well i mean what attracted me in the first place was this is new this yeah. is interesting and i think you know the uh the disability artist community has not embraced opulent mobility because it is not serious enough is, 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 is I think probably one complaint. Another complaint is that it's not 
relevant? You know, why should opulence be a part of disability? You know, it's like, no, disability is gritty and tough. I think that becomes a little self-fulfilling is part yeah. of what I am saying. Um, that I think that, and I, I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. Of course, there's a place for it. But just saying that you only need the gritty right. is like saying you only deserve one style of anything. Right. And I think that's absolutely wrong. Right. No, absolutely. So I think that, I mean, it, you know, on one hand, things have advanced a lot, you know, and to be able to have Crip Camp be as successful as it was, I mean, it wouldn't have been that successful 10 years ago. You know, the time, you know, these things are evolving, but it's still, it's still evolving. And, um, you know, I don't mind being at the uh, bleeding edge, you know, I mean, it's like we did that show in, in 82, 81. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think opulent mobility is getting more recognition. You know, I'd like to see it get even more, but, you know. It... Working on it. Yeah. We're talking I mean, to happening. both USC and the Brand Library in Glendale. So uh, it looks very promising. But I think that's that's the art. It's not the crepuscente. You know, it's it it's it's not the um I don't know if I ought to say this publicly, but um you know, until Rivalera submits a piece to opulent mobility, you know, that you know I maybe I, then we'll be serious enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean because Riva's not um she isn't into the grittiness necessarily. I mean she is she had she has her own very distinct, very strong style, um, yep. you know, in Sandy Yee and, um, uh, you know, just the whole Chicago scene, you know, have not yet embraced opulent mobility. And it's, they're not anti-opulent mobility, which is nice. You know, they just don't see it as relevant. And so, you know, we may never get to relevance, but. But you are, you're so relevant. I mean, just speaking <laughs> to someone who found out about you right before the deadline of this particular show. I mean, we we never see ourselves in movies or. Right. Or in any way, we, we never see ourselves being joyful or being, I mean, when, when I first started doing my fabric work, it was like, that transformation that we go through, the gods and goddesses of folklore and of old religions go through all that and it gives them a different power, right. you know? And that's what's happening to us. And nobody acknowledges that. Nobody even looks at it. I mean, you can, you can look, I mean, even today on what comes streaming and what comes on, movies and TV, we aren't there. We don't right. see ourselves. We're not reflected. And if we are, it's so serious and horrible. <laughs> you know, it's like, but that's not how we live our lives. There's joy in, in our lives. And it's like decorating a wheelchair. Why not? You know, we right. decorate faces and our, our clothing and everything. It's we're so marginalized. And this is a way yeah. of expanding the margins. Well, talking about power, I mean, that's really at the core yeah. of a lot of things that I look at, you know. And, and that I think what we choose. I think that, that there's power and opium And mobility. powerful. Yeah. I do what too. Is, yeah. Uh, and and quick, I, I know that. A quick digression. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I'll have to get back to it. I lost the name. <laughs> it's okay. But no, it's... Um, I, th I think that we are finding our relevance in different ways, and we're finding our audience right, in different right, ways. Right, exactly. And that is okay. But I think that the world is full of 
both inspiration porn and tragedy porn. Right. <laughs> and yeah. um, sometimes the only gritty becomes tragedy porn. Right, right. And um, that's its own addiction. And I'm saying that there are other ways to look at the world and that um, who, who are you choosing to hang out with? You know, and this is, this is the goal here. Who, 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 how can we build this community? Right. And, and one that where we are celebrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was real um, interesting to hear the group you were with where they want to honor the day their disability started, you know, right. the transformation should be honored. And uh, I think and it's, it's appropriate. Like, yeah. It's like the secret we have. Right. The only reason we have that it's a secret is that we're so marginalized. Right. It's well, like, and our own internalized ableism as well. Right, right. And and the way, you know, once our lives change, the way that we're, you know, we can't get back in because right. it's not visitable, you right, know. Right, right, right. And, and the way, you know, doctors treat you. And it's, a, it's this whole kind of syndrome thing. But you know, once you, you go through the transformation, you, you do laugh and you do want to, you know, you want opulence in your life and you want beer in your life, you know, right. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it, this is, this is a show that needs to happen and needs to be seen, I think. And, and I'm, I'm I was glad, so glad to be a part of it. And, uh, Thank you so I much hope. for doing it. Yeah, I'm absolutely. really glad. And that gives hope. me hope too that you know that you saw it and it resonated with you because I, you know, you certainly have, you know, uh, a sense of the movement and all of that stuff. So my well, quick drive. It's been tragic here because once we lost uh, Deborah Cunningham, who was the leader of our uh, independent living. Uh, community here she was so progressive and then she the, the organization was taken over by a a christian which i don't i don't mind that people are christians but she brought a very different value right. to it and so there were no more you know uh sex videos or, right, you know, right, right. and uh, they, there was a lot more there's a lot less protesting and a lot you know, a lot more, you well, know. What happened to a lot of independent living it. centers, I'm afraid. Accept, accept how things are and, and right. you know, God and blah, blah, blah. But it is happening in other arenas now, thank God. I mean, because back in the 70s, it was only happening at ILCs and universities and colleges, uh -huh. you know, and now it's happening in a lot of other places. Thank God. Um, thank God. My little digression was talking about decorating wheelchairs. Connie Boswell of the Boswell Sisters was a wheelchair user from polio, and she used to put sparklers in her spokes before she came out on stage. Oh, that's wonderful. That Isn't that like, wonderful? That was like back in the 30s? 30s, yeah. Yes, I love the Boswell Sisters. Me too. <laughs> but I didn't know that about them. I've only heard them. I haven't seen Right, Any so computer. Connie Boswell is a wheelchair user. Oh, right. I'm being That's part of my, my whole research into <laughs> disability and music. Nice. Oh, there's a Connie Boswell. Cool. There, there's Connie Boswell, a little bit on Connie Boswell. Oh, good. I thank you. Mr. Moon is on my my food uh, right now. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this. I really appreciate it. Well, this is fun, which is, I knew yeah. it would be. Thanks, Laura. As you absolutely, usual. and um, we'll do it again sometime soon. Good. Thank you. All right. Joy, Bye. Patricia. Good you to too. see you guys. Good well, to see you, Patricia. I didn't get to see you, but 
Glad you're here. Joy, good to see you. Yep. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.